Good morning. We are so encouraged by the presence of each one of you today. To our members, it's good to see each one of you. We do have several with us that have been out sick and glad that you're doing better and able to be back with us today. But we do have quite a few visitors today as well, and we're always glad to see you. And we welcome you to come back and worship with us at Pyburn Street any time that you may have the opportunity to do so. You are our honored guests, and we're thankful that you've come our way today. I recently read what might be termed a modern-day parable. And it went something like this. It said, the kingdom of God is like a man who wanted to build a carousel. So he began to build a team and amass the supplies that he needed. And what this came from, in 2008... There was a man in Kingsport, Tennessee, by the name of Gail Joe, And he had a dream of doing something special for the town that had come to claim his heart, that came to be his hometown. He had grown up in the town of uh, Binghamton, New York. Binghamton, New York is known as the carousel capital of the world. Gail had grown up spending most of his free time in the town's various parks and spending time riding those carousels. And he remembered with great fondness the joy that he felt. And he wanted to be able to share a little bit of that with his new hometown. So he proposed this idea and he took it before the city council of Kingsport, Tennessee. And one of the city council members scoffed at the idea. She said it's too expensive, too time consuming, it won't ever be done. In fact, she said Kingsport will have a carousel when pigs fly. Well, that city council member was Gail Joe's wife, Kimberly. Well, undeterred in his mission, Gail Joe turned to three of his friends, told them about the vision that he had, the goal that he had set for that community. And they developed a team, and they lovingly nicknamed this group the Four Horsemen of Kingsport. And they set out to find a way to carry out this plan, to build this carousel for their hometown. But the first problem that they faced is none of them knew how to really do anything. They weren't carpenters, they weren't wood carvers, they weren't electricians, they weren't mechanics. None of them were good at at working with their hands. They all worked white-collar jobs. And so rather than just throw up their hands and say, you know what, we, we can't do this, it's a losing battle. They began at nights and on weekends taking classes at a local trade school learning how to perform those tasks that would be necessary in order to carry out this mission. Well, after a couple of years, the city of Kingsport, they realized these guys aren't going away. They're sincere in this desire. And so they had an empty warehouse that was sitting in town, and they allowed these men to use that warehouse rent-free for as long as they needed in order to carry out this mission. Well, just as things seemed to be falling into place, just as work was starting to begin, Gail Joe was diagnosed with rapidly advancing early onset dementia. And he claimed his life in the year 2010. Well, many in the community were afraid that his dream was going to die along with him. But his fellow horsemen would not allow that to happen. They dug in. And they decided that this was something that they could not accomplish just with the three of them. And so they started to offer their own classes. And started bringing in people from the community. Started getting church groups and civic clubs and and, and school groups together. And we're teaching them the, the ability to wood carve and, and do these other tasks that were necessary. Well, each one of 
these individual groups that came together. They were all assigned a task. And the task that they were given was that each one of them was to design and carve their own figure, their own statue, so to speak, for the carousel. And each one of them were given a degree of artistic freedom. And they came up with some very interesting ideas. But the most intriguing one was one that was carved by Gail Joe's wife. The one that had been the most vocal against the building of this carousel. Can you guess what it was? It was a pig with wings. (laughs) A pig with wings. Well, in 2015, after seven years of work, with over 300 different people volunteering their time, Over 700 people donating finances. The Kingsport Carousel was finally open and ready to ride. Well, in the years since that, the Kingsport Carousel has come to be a a symbol of the community. Many of the marketing materials and things for the city of Kingsport now have a figure of this carousel as, as the symbol of their city. They take great pride in it. It's a local landmark. And all it took was one man with a master plan. One man with a goal calling out to others. Reaching out to, first, his his three friends. They amassed a team. And then as time went on, they began to expand. Until that task was finally accomplished. Now you may be wondering, Josh, why have you spent almost 10 minutes telling us this story this morning? Well, it's because this story is a great illustration of the task that Jesus faced at the beginning of his ministry. Jesus came to earth to carry out his father's master plan. And he started out as one man. When he came back from the wilderness after being tempted of the devil, he set out on his earthly ministry as one person. One person. But this morning, we're going to consider this section of Scripture that Brother David shared with us of Jesus calling his first four followers. We might even refer to them, going with the illustration that we saw of the carousel, as Jesus' four horsemen. I mean, they were his right-hand men. They were there with him seemingly from the very beginning. Now, of course, we know later on these four were, were added to eight more. Eight others were added to that number. And they eventually would be the ones who would become the apostles once the Holy Spirit fell upon them on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But I want us to notice this morning, this call, and to see how it would apply to us today in looking at the concept of answering the call of Jesus. Let's begin our study in Mark chapter 1 by looking at verses 14 and 15. Here it's recorded now, after that John was put in prison, this is referring to John the baptizer, after that John was put in prison. Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now notice that Mark begins his gospel account by establishing the time frame in which these events were taking place. It was shortly after the time that John had been arrested. John is now in prison. His ministry has been greatly curtailed because of this. But it's interesting to me that Mark skips about six months to a year of Jesus' early ministry. We have to go to the Gospel of John to see much of what took place during that period of time. But Mark skips over These very early days of Jesus' ministry. But we know that during that time, 
the ministries of Jesus and John, they, they kind of overlapped with each other. We know that they both were preaching. They both were proclaiming repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And we know that even on one occasion, some of the disciples of John came to him and they were concerned and really complaining about Jesus. They came to John and they said, John, said, this man that you baptized, this one that you testified about, said, he's over here on the other side of the Jordan. He's doing the same thing that you've been doing and everybody's going to him. They're not going to you anymore. They're all going to him and he's doing the same thing that you were doing. Well, John set them straight by telling them that He understood and they needed to understand that his impact, his focus, his ministry had to decrease in significance and that Jesus had to increase. You see, John realized that his job was done. He was to be the forerunner of Christ. He was to be that herald going before Jesus announcing that the Messiah was about to come. Well, now that Jesus was on the scene and had begun his ministry, the ministry of John was fulfilled. He knew that it was time for him to take a step back and let Jesus come into the foreground. And let him run with that ministry that he had come to carry out. But we find that his arrest by Herod... And later his being put to death would effectively remove him from the scene. Now we know that he still had a few disciples that continued to go and to preach. And and this continued even into the book of Acts. We see those who were continuing to teach the baptism of John. But the ministry of John came to an end. That time had been fulfilled. Now, the text goes on to say, and we don't know if whether it was for safety's sake or whether it was just a matter of, uh, of coincidence and timing. But about the time that John was arrested, Jesus changed his home base. No longer was he going to be centered around Jerusalem and going out from Jerusalem. He went to Capernaum. He went to Galilee, and that was to become his home base, the hub of his ministry from that point forward. But whenever he went into this new region, he went preaching a message. And the message that he proclaimed in Galilee was the same message that he had been proclaiming in Judea. Repent. Repent and hear the gospel. Believe the word of God. He said, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Now, a lot of things have transpired in the life of Jesus before we come to this point. But I don't think that it's just a coincidence that these are the very first recorded words of Jesus in the gospel of Mark. I think that's intentional. Because it shows us what the focus of Jesus' ministry was. Was to get people ready for the coming of the kingdom. To convince them of the need to repent and to place their faith in Him and in the words that He was proclaiming. But He started by proclaiming that the time was fulfilled. And we see Paul echoing those words in Galatians 4 and verse 4 when he said, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. But to really understand the timeline that we're looking at here, we have to go back into the book of Daniel. And we really don't have time to discuss this exhaustively this morning, but I want to give just a brief overview of a couple of prophecies that we see In Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 9, we are presented with pretty much an exact timeline of when the Messiah was going to come on the scene. These prophecies are referred to as Daniel's 70 weeks prophecies. Now, most Bible scholars are in agreement that this time frame of 70 weeks, it's 
symbolic of 490 years. And there's a big algorithm that they go through that tries to explain where they come up with that. And like I said, we don't have time to discuss all of that. But most are in agreement. This is referring to a period of 490 years. And this 490 year period, most agree, began with the time that the Persian king Artaxerxes allowed the Jews to leave Babylonian captivity and go back to Jerusalem. That whenever they went back and began to rebuild the temple, to rebuild that city and to reestablish their culture in the city of Jerusalem, that is when this 490 year period began. Well, that would have been in the year 444 B.C. Well, this began somewhat of a stopwatch leading up to the coming of the Messiah, His kingdom, and ultimately the culmination of the destruction of the kingdom of the Jews in A.D. 70. And since the Jews in the first century knew about these prophecies of Daniel, They knew the significance of the numerical system. We talked about that a lot in our study of the book of Revelation. They understood the symbolism that these numbers meant. And they would have recognized that it's getting close to the time that this Messiah is supposed to come. And so we can understand the anticipation and the excitement that they felt when the ministry of John began. They began to hear the things that he was saying. You know, the kingdom's almost here. What you've been looking for for 449 years, that which Daniel prophesied, it's almost here. It's about to come. You need to repent. You need to get your life right. You need to be ready for the coming of that kingdom. So there was great anticipation, great expectation. But Jesus began his ministry, and we might say concluded the ministry of John with these words, the time is fulfilled, meaning the stopwatch has run out. These 449 years, they're coming to an end. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Now, kind of as a general rule, We talk about this idea of the kingdom of God, and and rightfully so, we describe that as being the church. But I think there is more to this terminology of the kingdom of God than simply the church. In a general sense, the kingdom of God is the overall rule, kingship, dominion, and sovereignty of God. It is wholehearted devotion to God. And today we see this presented in a present day manifestation in the form of the church. The church is the kingdom of God that is in reality today. Now you may remember back during the Sermon on the Mount in Jesus' model prayer. He mentioned that when they pray, they need to pray that the kingdom would come. Thy kingdom come. Now, there are some, even some of our brethren, who try to explain this away in an attempt to try to say that this is something that would be acceptable for us to pray today. But has the kingdom come? Yes. The kingdom came into establishment on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. So, if the kingdom has already come, then why would we pray to God asking Him for His kingdom to come? We wouldn't. That's not something that we should do. But in that model prayer, when Jesus uttered those words, the kingdom was still at hand. It hadn't come yet. But in that, he was making the statement that it was about to come. And they were to pray to God in anticipation of the kingdom coming. They were to change their life and change their focus in anticipation of the coming of the kingdom. And since that kingdom was about to come, the message that Jesus proclaimed was repent. You know what? Go ahead. Start getting ready, getting your life right. 
Repent of these false ideas, these false views. Bring your life into as close of a, of, of a semblance to the law of Moses as you can. That way when the kingdom does come, you're going to be much better prepared to enter into that kingdom. Get ready. Repent. Believe the good news so that you can be a part of the kingdom of God when it does come. They had to change their mind. They had to change their direction, the focus of their life. And by doing that, it was going to change their behavior. The way they conducted themselves. But in addition to repentance, Jesus said that we must believe. These two things go hand in hand, folks. Belief and repentance go hand in hand because we cannot have repentance without belief. And true belief will bring about true repentance. We can't have one without the other. But since Jesus had not yet died and the kingdom had not yet come, they were commanded to believe not that the kingdom had already come, but that God was working out His will through Christ to bring about the kingdom. That the kingdom was about to come into establishment. And in repentance, they displayed a desire to be right with God. A desire to be a part of the Lord's work. But then Mark moves very quickly from these introductory remarks to the calling of Jesus' first disciples. Let's pick up our reading in verse 16 of Mark chapter 1. Now as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishers. Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you to become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets and followed him. And when he had gone a little further thence, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who also were in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them. And they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants and went after him. Now, through information that's recorded by other gospel writers, we know that this was not the first time that Peter and Andrew had interaction with Jesus. In fact, John 1, verses 35 through 42, records that Andrew was there at the Jordan when Jesus came to John to be baptized. When John testified, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world, one of the men that was there and heard that testimony was Andrew. And the text tells us that immediately he went and found his brother. Immediately he went and found Peter. He said, Peter, you got to come with me. He he said, I've found the Messiah. You have to come. You've got to meet this man. Now, James and John, since they were fishing partners with Peter and Andrew and were accustomed to spending long hours working side by side with them, we can conclude that these men more than likely had at least heard of Jesus. More than likely they had heard Peter and Andrew speaking about this man. But it's also entirely possible that all four of these men had had previous interactions with Jesus. But think about the four men that he called to first. Well, let's go back to our story that we began with. The three friends that Gail Joe called to help him. You remember I said they really had no skills. They had none of the marks and and none of the abilities that they needed to actually carry out that task. Well, look at who Jesus called to first. Did he go to the rabbis? No. Did he go to the chief priests? No. Did he go to the ones that would have those skills of of, of speaking and, and persuasion? No. He called career fishermen. Men who up to this point had spent their life fishing on the Sea of Galilee. Folks, these were tough, hard-working men. Likely men who had very little formal education. They were what we might refer to as just common, ordinary folks. 
common, hard-working people. They weren't wealthy. They weren't popular. They weren't famous or powerful. They were just ordinary people. Now, in choosing these ordinary men, Jesus was proclaiming that with ordinary people, he was going to bring about extraordinary things. What was going to be fulfilled was going to be fulfilled by those the least likely to fulfill it. Those who did not have the skills that were necessary. But these were men who were willing to learn. Who were willing to develop into apostles. But also in this we're able to see that regardless of who we are. Regardless of what our status in life is, regardless of what our career choice may be, what our background is, what our social status is, what our race is, our country of origin, the language that we speak, it doesn't matter. We all can answer the call of the gospel. We all can accomplish great things, even as common, ordinary people. Well, then we see that the call that they received was not some ornate theological system. It was not some deep understanding that they had to come to before they could be followers of Christ. He didn't invite them to join a certain ideology or to adopt some philosophical view or some theological system that he had devised. No. He said, follow me. Follow me. To become his close friends. To become his disciples. He said, folks, follow me. Learn of me. Watch me. Pattern your life after me. Now, yes, they would later receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and would graduate to the level of apostles. But for now, they were simply to be disciples. They were to be learning. They were to be soaking up everything they could about Jesus. As much knowledge and as much experience as they could. Now, there's a great lesson that we can take from this today. Folks, when we go out into the world and we seek to call people to Christ by the gospel message, folks, we are not directing them to join a man-made organization. We are not asking them to adopt some ideology or some new age philosophy. We're not asking them to accept an ideological system of belief or a theological system. No, we're asking them, we're inviting them, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Learn of Him. Pattern your life after the example that He set. Learn of Him. Become like Him. But third, we see that Jesus used something that they were familiar with to help them understand the call that was being extended to them. He called fishermen to become fishermen. They knew about fishing. That was their career. But he told them, he said, you're not going to be fishing for fish anymore. He said, but from now on, he said, you're going to be fishing for people. You're going to be going out and trying to bring those people in, casting that net of the gospel, bringing them to Christ. This is what Jesus referred to in the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, when he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. But the problem is, folks, in many places, we've stopped fishing for men. The problem that we've run into, as one preacher put it, he said, with all of our education, all of our fine buildings, our image of the church, we are doing less 
to win people to Christ than our unschooled forefathers did. We are no longer fishers of men, but are merely keepers of the aquarium. And then he went on, he says, and we spend most of our time trying to swap fish from other people's tanks. Folks, if this is true with you and you're merely seeking to keep the aquarium, you're not trying to reach out to those who are lost and to fish for men, if you're interested only in trying to steal fish from someone else's tank, then you need to change your focus. Folks, there's a lot of lost people in the world. There's a lot of people that need to hear the gospel. And folks, we are the only ones that have the bait. We are the earthen vessels that the gospel has been placed within. That's the bait. But we have to be willing to put that bait in the right place. You know, it's not going to do any good to sit there and fish out of your own fish aquarium. You're just going to catch the same fish over and over and over. But you've got to get out in the world. You've got to go to where the fish are. You've got to carry the gospel to them. Jesus said in Matthew 9, 37, the harvest is plenteous. But then you have the sad part, but the laborers are few. There's so many people that need to hear the gospel. So many people that need to answer the call of Jesus, this gospel call. But there's just not enough people that are fishing for men. We're merely keeping the aquarium. Put it another way, Jesus could have said the fish are plentiful, but there's not enough people fishing. But then Jesus makes a promise. He says that if we will follow Him... That he will make us or he will develop us into fishers of men. He will equip us to do his work. He will help us in developing the knowledge and the skills that we need. The confidence that we need to carry the gospel. Our job is to follow, believe, become, and then go fishing. But then just briefly, because we are out of time this morning, I want us just briefly to notice the response of these men. Both sets of these brothers, when Jesus called out to them, they immediately, they dropped what they were doing. And they followed Jesus. Immediately. They believed that Jesus is the Messiah. They believed that He is who they needed to follow. And when He called out to them, they were not going to let a moment pass by without obeying Him. Now that meant they had to leave their occupation behind. That meant they had to leave their possessions behind. Folks, they just left the nets, left the boats, and went about their business. Began following Jesus. They had to leave their family behind. James and John left their father there with the hired servants to get the job done. But they understood that in order to follow Jesus, sometimes it comes at a great price. In Mark 8, verses 34 and 35, Jesus said, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake... And the Gospels, the same, shall save it. Folks, when we choose to follow Jesus, it can't be just another hobby that we add to our life. It can't be just another time slot that we're filling in. It can't be just another addition to our calendar. Whenever we become children of God, it's like changing our citizenship. Changing the rights, changing the responsibilities. We become citizens of the kingdom of God. And we do the things that are expected of those citizens. We have to give our lives over to Him in obedience to His will. 
And in return, we will receive the forgiveness of our sins. But also, we receive hope, purpose, power. We're promised that we will live an abundantly blessed life here. And that heaven will be our home. If we will live a life of faithfulness to him. And just like those first followers who answered the call of Jesus, we have a task before us to fulfill. Jesus knew that one day his life was going to come to an end. And it would be up to these men to carry on the task of proclaiming the gospel, of instituting the Lord's church. And folks, they understood that there's no more important task than that. And they accepted that responsibility. And those of us who are children of God, we need to make sure we have accepted that responsibility. Folks, the kingdom is here. It's here. Those of you that are children of God, we're a part of that kingdom. Those who are not, guess what? You can be a part of that kingdom. You can answer the call of the gospel. You can obey the gospel message. You can repent. You can believe that good message, the good news. If you haven't already done so, answer that call today. Leave your nets. Get out of the boat. Whatever it is that you're doing, lay that aside and follow Jesus. Come to Him today. Answer that call. Now, there's some people here today that you need to start by declaring your faith. You need to understand that, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But then you need to repent of your sins and you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. But there also may be those here today that need to answer Jesus' call in another way. It may be that you are a child of God, but you need to answer that call by returning to Christ. By laying aside the sins that you've allowed to come back in your life. And come back. Answer that call to faithfulness today. Renew the commitment that you have. Renew that commitment to following Christ. Folks, Jesus calls us. And the way that He does that is through the message. The Apostle Paul said that he is not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because it is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus calls to us through the word of God. And we encourage you today. That if you've never answered that call by obeying the gospel, that you'll make that decision today. Or if you've strayed from the faith, answer that call by coming back. Be restored to the faith. This morning, if you examine yourself, and there's a spiritual need in your life that we can assist you with through our prayers, through baptism, then we encourage you to make that known at this time while together we stand and sing.